And now we are live and I hand over to Simon. Welcome, Simon. Thank you Thank for you being with us today. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dirk and Bjorn. Uh, yeah, thanks for inviting me. Uh, this is intended to be quite informal, so please ask questions in the chat and then uh, Dirk will field them. And I said, I'll, I'll have some sections um, for you um, for answering questions. But if there's a lot of confusion, then Dirk will just interrupt me and uh, get me to explain things a bit better. Uh, so I'm now going to share my screen. So hopefully uh, entire screen and with any luck. Can you now see my slides? Not yet. Not yet. Let's see. Have I? No, it starts. I can. Yeah. Okay. Right. Great. Yep. So, <clears throat> excellent. Wonders of modern technology. <clears throat> Sorry. So, my name is Simon Bennett. I'm the Zap project lead, and I work for um, one of the Mozilla security teams on web security. And this is an introduction to the OSZ attack proxy. So, the plan for this talk is I'm going to give a quick overview of Zap. Then I'm going to do some demos. So I'm going to show you the desktop and then show you the new heads up display. Well, it's not that new anymore. And lastly, I'll talk about automation. Automation isn't always the easiest thing to demo. Um, so a bit of talking around um, some demos, which inevitably will go wrong because, because they're demos. So I thought I'd start with the uh, what is Zap. Um, I'm hoping most of you've heard about it, uh, but not necessarily. Um, so we'll start with this. It does actually feel a bit strange just talking to my computer and not being able to look around the room and see reactions and things. So I uh, hope this is going to be okay. Uh, so Zap is a tool for finding vulnerability in web application, vulnerabilities in web applications. And it's not really, you know, it does find vulnerabilities, sort of known vulnerabilities, some known vulnerabilities with standard packages, but really it's much more focused on finding new and interesting vulnerabilities in custom applications. So it's not particularly targeting WordPress or anything like that. It is custom web applications and finding new and exciting things wrong with them. It is an OWASP project, pro project. So as you probably know, OWASP has a lot of projects, but there's a limited number of flagship projects. And these are projects that uh, have been proved to actually be in the, the most mature and, and really good places for people to start when they're new to security. It is, like all OWASP projects, completely free and open source. We don't have a pro version and we'll never have one. And it is cross-platform, so it's actually written in Java. Um, so as long as you've got a uh, JVM 8 or above on whatever platform, then it will run. And as I was chatting to the guys earlier, uh, we did actually get, get it running on a Raspberry Pi a few years ago. It is internationalized and localized. And this is something I'm quite proud of, actually. Um, I think very few security tools are internationalized and localized. Um, particularly even the commercial ones, they always seem to be in English. Um, whereas Zap is completely internationalized and it's been localized into something like 30 languages. Uh, and, you know, so we've got details online of which ones um, are the most, which are it has been translated to most of all, but we've got crowding projects which allow you to help with that localization effort as well. It is, well, I'm going to claim it's well maintained. Um, we have a team, a core team of, there's about four of us now who are working on it whenever we can. We're all volunteers, so no one works on it full time, um, but we focus on it and we have a, a large number of uh, occasional volunteers who drop, um, pop in and pop out and do smaller things. And we also take part in things like Google Summer of Code, um, as well as Winter of Security, those kind of um, initiatives where we get students working on SAP for fairly significant projects. And the last um, point is something that may be a little bit controversial. Uh, but we are now claiming that Zap is the world's most widely used web application scanner. Uh, this is a fairly bold claim. Um, so I think I need to justify it in some way. It's actually very difficult to tell, you know, there are very few um, statistics about these things we've been looking around. Um, so we've been claiming to be the world's most popular free and open source web security tool for a long time. And I 
I've been claiming that at um, various international conferences and no one's disagreed with me, so that must be true. Uh, but we're going for this one, uh, this claim as well. And the justification is um, with the latest release, um, ZAP290, we've had more than 85,000 direct downloads and more than 220,000 Docker pulls. And one of the few things we know is that Zap has been run more than 1 million times. And that was in March, last March, just in one month that was. So we are not aware of any other um, security tool, any commercial tools that have that kind of usage uh, or open source ones as well. We can't be sure, but that's why we've made this as a statement. Uh, we've put it on Twitter on the website. And if you know different, then please let us know and uh, give some justification as well. So that's the uh, that's the controversial claim out of the way. So who is Zap for? Um, this is another thing that seem, people seem to be a little bit confused about. So it's actually got, you know, we try to be quite wide in who we're targeting. Developers and functional testers are QA are definitely one of our key markets, if you like. Um, I was a developer, well, still am really, um, but I started off in development and, you know, it, I actually started Zap as a security tool to, for developers. I was only when the security people started coming along telling me they used it as well that I changed that um, tagline. Uh, but it is really great for developers and functional testers. It could well be the only web security tool that you need if you're a developer or a QA person. And it will help you find vulnerabilities very early on the development life cycle. Uh, you can use it manually. And as we'll see, it's very good. It's, automation is one of ZAP's strengths. It is also ideal for students. Obviously, free and open source is great. Um, so there's no cost involved. Um, but it's very functional. And you can look at the source code so you can see exactly how ZAP works. Um, so there's there's nothing hidden. It's all everything is available, and you can also contribute. I mean, anyone can get involved with Zap. Um, we're a, very much a community project, and we want people to get involved. Uh, but a lot of students have got involved um, through initiatives like Google Summer of Code and things like that. And we know that students have produced some very um, impressive features. I'll actually just switch over. If I go to the Zap website, zaproxy.org, we have a getting involved section and if I scroll down there's a student hall of fame so these are all the students who have actually have significant changes in zap um, so ranging from support for web sockets the ajax spider um, advanced access control testing there's a whole range of things so you can see all of the details there and if you want to get on that um, student hall of fame list then just get in touch with me uh, and finally, Zap is for security professionals. Now, I, I have seen various things online saying, you know, is Zap a replacement for, insert your favorite um, security tool here. Uh, but I think that's missing the point. If you're a security professional, I think you should have a good understanding of the strengths and weaknesses of all the top security tools. And then you should use them accordingly. If you're a pro professional pen tester, I would expect you to have a BERT Pro license. But I, would, I think you should also understand Zap's strengths and weaknesses as well and use that accordingly. So we know a lot of security professionals who do use Zap, um, and I'm sure they use other security tools as well. And that makes sense to me. I think that's the, the right way of doing things. Um, if you just focus on one tool and never use any other, even if it was Zap, I think as a professional, that's the wrong approach. You should try all of the tools and understand what they do well and what they don't do so well. Uh, just want a little bit about how often Zap is released. So we try and do what we call full releases a couple of times a year. Um, and we've been keeping roughly up to that level. Um, so well, someone's got a loud keyboard there. Might be beyond. Um, so um, we we have been keeping to a couple of releases a year. That's this very approximate. Um, but we can, so that's, if we make changes to what we call the Zap core, we have to do a full release. But we do have an, a plug-in architecture, so we can release any of the add-ons at any point. We can release new add-ons, and we can release existing ones. And some of the things like the Ajax Spider, some of the core Zap features are implemented of add-ons, um, and the scripting, and all those kind of things. So we can actually fix and, and improve on Zap functionality quite rapidly uh, for quite a lot of things. We do have weekly releases. So every week, typically on a Monday, uh, there's a new zip and a new Docker image. 
Um, so, so Zap is updated very frequently, and we actually do have a live Docker image. So that means that whenever anything is committed to the core, then a new Docker image is built and is available within the hour. So do we have any questions so far? There was one question, but I don't know whether it fits in here. T Timo was uh, asking whether that's a recommended presentation or workshop uh, to introduce students into ZAP. Not really one aimed at students. Uh, we do have a series of videos called ZAP in 10, which I will uh, give links to later. Okay. Um, but. Uh, uh, maybe, it depends how well this goes. This could be a good introduction. Um, so I haven't done any in introductions to Zap for a little while. Uh, if this goes well, maybe it could be this one. If not, then uh, we'll try and find a different one. But but okay. the Zap in 10 series is actually really, really good. So ah, because great, it's, thank it's you. small, small, short videos, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's easy, easy to consume. Yeah, I, th I think those are the best ones to recommend. There, there's an evil question. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know whether you want to answer it now. I just read it to you from okay, developer's perspective. Uh, what would be uh, some of advantages or differences between Zap and Burp? Uh, well, from a developer point of view, obviously the free and open source thing I think is very important. Um, I think Zap auto Zap's automation is a real power, um, real strength. So Zap, um, you can do pretty much everything you can do in the desktop UI via the API. And Zap has some very um, powerful options for automation, um, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, but you know, from, from what I've seen, I believe that Zap has the most powerful API of any security tool, and that includes the uh, commercial ones. Don't, you know, I won't swear to that, I don't know them all, um, but Zap is definitely up there. So Zap's automation is very, very powerful. But when it comes to tools, you know, why why do you have to only use one? You know, you can use both. <laughs> so you can, you, can, you can use multiple tools. You're not forced to uh, choose one and, and stick with that. So, uh, you know, if you want to, if you have Burt Pro licenses and you want to use automation, try them both and use them both. Cool. Okay, so I will now demonstrate these the Zap desktop. So hopefully you can now see the Zap desktop. <coughs> so this yes, is excellent, great. <laughs> so this is what you'll see when you start start Zap. Uh, this is two nine zero, and we've got this new big friendly welcome screen, and the idea is. Uh, we're trying to make things a little bit easier for people. So we have three options. One, a kind of learn more thing, which just takes you to some links. Some of them are local and some of them on uh, online resources. We have this option for automated scan. It's a fairly simple automated scan. I'll talk through it a little bit later. Um, but the main one, which we're kind of hope people will start with, is the manual explore option. Now, um, so what, what this does is this gives you an option to put in a URL and then launch browsers. Because if you're doing manual exploring, the best way to use Zap, um, between when you use it manually, is to configure your browser to proxy through Zap. You can do this manually, and you can, so what you need to do is you need to configure your browser's proxy, and then you need to actually um, import the Zap root CA. So Zap has a root CA certificate um, that is generated uniquely for you, and you need to import it. I've got fed up with doing that. It's just a lot of hassle. That's why we allow you to launch browsers through, from within Zap, and you can launch any modern browser, meaning Chrome or Firefox, because there's, they're the only ones that can be easily controlled. So you need to put your uh, URL in. And so I've got a couple of test applications here. And Bjorn is going to be very pleased, because I'm going to start with um, G-Shop. And we've got this op an option to enable HUD, which I will use later. Uh, but what you do is then you just launch the browser. And what so Zap will now launch a browser. This is a completely new browser profile. And you can you now have access to Juice Shop and you can see things and you can click around and you can do all your normal stuff. So what happens now is I will just close that 
and you will see that we've now got stuff in the sites tree in the web sockets and in the history so what's happened is zap configured firefox to proxy through uh through zap and it configured to ignore um the any certificate warnings and so we can now see all of the requests that we're making if you select any of these requests then you can see the request and the responses here and if we go down here we can see basically a tree view so this is a hierarchical view of the application that we've seen so far and again you can just select any of these things and you can see the requests and responses and we also see the web sockets there and also we'll see alerts as well so what happens is zap does what we call passive scanning by default so it passively scans everything that flows through it so we can see already that we have some alerts um, and you know these may I mean, something like um, cause misconfiguration and that depend you know that depends on the application so okay there's access control allow origin star that may or may, be, may not be a vulnerability but it's the kind of thing that we think people want to know about um, so the alerts are not necessarily vulnerabilities it all depends on your website um, what it's trying to do but these are things that you may well want to look into so zap is passively scanning all of the http requests and responses and actually all the web socket requests and responses so it is passively scanning web sockets as well so um so you can now see uh there's, there's a lot quite a bit more on the screen but there's actually this, it can get a lot more complicated so uh, there's a lot of stuff being hidden we try to remove things that weren't absolutely essential um but what i'll do is kind of show you some stuff here there's this little icon up here which will show you all of the tabs because if you notice we've got this deep kind of plus here and this will actually show you the tabs you haven't got visible um they what we try and do is actually make those visible when they when you need them uh, but you can actually use this and show all of the tabs and as you can see there's quite a lot going on um, and you can actually then close those ones uh, if you don't want to see them but if there's particular tabs you want to see all the time uh, for example the spider tab maybe you always want to see that then you can pin the tabs as well so that will then stay there even if i close all tabs and the other thing is you can actually right click and we strongly recommend this because we actually have context specific right click options pretty much everywhere and um, so if you right click in the history tree you'll get a whole load of things if you right sorry the, the sites tree in the history you'll get a whole load of options and actually if you select um, text in the request and response then you'll get different options there as well so right clicking is absolutely key when you start playing around with zap so you can go through and manually explore your application and you can then um, if you want to resend things you can actually have a look and open any particular request and you can change whatever you like and then you can send the response and if you send the request you'll get the response so you can do all that all those wonderful things um, but we also have various automated options as well so if you right click anywhere uh, particularly in the main windows somewhere like so if i select the uh, juice shop top level you'll see we've got this um, attack option so we have a load of automated tools we have the spider so the spider is a traditional spider and it's kind of fast and furious uh, but it doesn't handle javascript so well so we also have an ajax spider and if you click any of these things then you will see uh, and someone's still got a loud keyboard by the way uh, so you'll see you've got various options when you launch the spider but we actually have advanced options as well so you can zap is highly configurable um, and the more you get to know, understand zap the more you'll understand why these configurations are there we also have uh, said the ajax spider and the ajax spider works differently um because i said the traditional spider doesn't understand javascript but what the ajax spider does it actually launches browsers and we can launch firefox chrome phantom js safari html unit and with firefox and chrome we can um, launch headless versions as well and that's quite useful because then you don't have the browsers popping up all the time and uh, i've got i said loads of options for those as well so these spiders are useful when you're doing manual pen testing because 
you know, really should try and explore the application as well as possible yourself. But then actually I'll just kick off the um, spider very quickly. If I run the spider now, so this will be quite quick because I said it, and it won't find everything. But what we'll see is a whole whole load of extra things are then included somewhere down here. So, and what you'll see is the where I've actually visited something manually. You will just see the in the sites tree. You'll just see the flag, um, the method, and the um, name of the resource. But here, something like the API. You, if you can see, there's a kind of fuzzy black blob there. That's, that's actually a spider. So you can see which of these requests you've visited manually and which ones the spider has actually found. Um, and that works with the Ajax spider as well, but they're colored red in that case. So that gives you an idea of the kind of um, content that you fail to find manually. And that could be interesting because it could be hidden in some way or maybe you just missed part of the application. So the spiders are useful for when you're um, doing things manually, but they're kind of essential when you're doing automation because, well, I mean, if you've got good unit tests you can proxy through Zap, then that's the best option. But if you haven't, or even you've got good unit tests, then the spiders are really good ways of exploring things. We also have the option to do an active scan. So this is where we're actually doing the attacking. And by default, you can just kick things off. Um, but we have this idea of policies, so I'll give, go through those in a minute. Um, but what we have is we have a whole load of advanced options. Um, so we can actually choose to, you can choose to actually filter things out. So you can um, make sure you only attack particular methods or response codes or particular tags that you want to attack. The input vectors, you've got very fine grain control over which input vectors, which which, which is what Zap actually understands to attack. So you can things things like see things like the URL query strings and post data, we automatically attack. Things like the URL path, we don't automatically attack, but you can change that. HTTP headers, cookie data, and script input vectors. So we, you can actually script loads of things through Zap, which I'll try and cover a little bit in, in a minute. <laughs> we have custom input vectors. So you can actually say for particular requests, OK, I want to attack this particular string here. Um, so you can be very specific about what you want to attack. And you can actually say which technologies you want to target. By default, everything is enabled. But if you're dealing with an application where you know you don't have particular things, you don't have um, an Oracle database, well, there's no point in doing attacks that target Oracle databases. So you can turn these things off. And for when you're doing manual pen testing, it's not so maybe not so important. But when you're doing automated pen te um, testing, security testing, then being having this fine grain control is a really useful it can chew and allows you to speed things up and reduces false positives. And we have this policy thing here, but what I'm going to do is actually show you the um, scan policy dialog, which is there. So we can actually, you can define your own scan policies. And with the scan policies, you have very fine grain control. So you can actually set things at a very high level, or you can, for the individual um, uh, attack uh, individual rules, you can actually say, OK, we want to turn particular things off, or we've got uh, low, medium and high thre um, thresholds, and we've got different strengths as well. So the zap scanning is you've got a lot of control there. Uh, so there's there's a lot of, to delve into if you really want to uh, get involved in that. And of course, we've got the standard intercept things. So I did actually um, so we've got these um, buttons at the top which allow you to do things very quickly. Um, so what you can do is actually what I'll do is I'm going to go and I'm actually a bit more familiar with Bodget and so I know how to show off various things. So sorry Bjorn, but I'm going to show a couple of things in Bodget. One of the things... It's okay, it's okay. Bodget is also <laughs> nice. <laughs> but very simplistic. It's, it's nice and simplistic, and it's a traditional web application. Um, so one of the things you know you'll find here is you're kind of limited into what quantity you can actually put in. But of course, um, what you can do is you can go from your browser. You can switch here, and we can turn on this option to actually set a breakpoint. So uh, if I just go and turn that on, and then 
update the basket, then nothing happens because we've intercepted that in Zap and we can go in and change it to whatever we want and submit that and then that will be reflected in the UI. So like any good security tool, you can intercept and change all of the requests and responses. And that works for both HTTP, HTTPS and web sockets as well. Simon. Yeah. Um, one question would uh, fit good in here. Uh, there was a question regarding uh, customized payload for XSS, for example. Yeah. So if you don't, uh, put in a number, can you, for example, load a file or so where you have uh, XSS payloads in there? Sure. So now is actually a good time to talk about scripting. <laughs> so Zap has this scripts tab here. And basically, we have a huge number of different script types. And scripts are tightly hooked into Zap. So basically, they hook into a load of different places and allow you to do pretty much anything you like. So we have active scan rules, and we actually have... So I've got a few installed here, and one of them is actually user-defined attacks. And so these are just standard um, scan rules. And this particular one, as you can see, so, so we actually, the scripts are displayed in Zap and you can edit them in Zap as well. So Zap um, supports editing of, um, so you can actually create your, um, and test your scripts in Zap while you're, while you're using it. So here you can see we've got a load of attacks and we've got some evidence we look for. And this is just a simple rule that, so you can scan either a node, but in this particular case, that's like a node in the sites tree. In this particular case, we want to scan particular parameters. So this is just the example of a scan rule, and here's where we're, we're raising alert. So this one, you can actually just drop in your own attacks straight away and whatever you want to look for. But scripts can do anything you like. We've got a um, community scripts repo where people share scripts and you can actually install all of those in one go. So, you know, you can do whatever you like. And that's one of the, the strengths of Zap is you can change Zap on the fly. That's essentially what you're doing with scripting. And so we've got uh, the active scan rules. We have authentication scripts. So with so you can teach Zap how to authenticate to your application. And I actually ran a session um, last Friday for all day DevOps uh, in which I actually ended up being able to authenticate to Juice Shop by launching Firefox and using Google authentication. So we can even go that, that far. I'm not saying it's easy, but you can definitely do that far. We have extender scripts, and these actually allow you to add functionality to the Zap desktop itself. So you can add right-click options, you can add new um, tabs, anything you like. Um, we have um, scripts for the fuzzers. We have what we call HTTP sender scripts, and these basically uh, get invoked whenever any requests and responses flow through Zap. Um, so you can do anything you like. Passive scan rules, payload generators, proxy ones, which are the same as HTTP sender, but only affect proxy proxied requests. We have Selenium scripts, um, so you can actually run scripts in browsers once they're launched from Zap, for example, um, when using Ajax Spider. Script input vectors, so if Zap doesn't understand the types of um, Say, say you have a particular format, you 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 particularly encoding that Zap doesn't understand. You can put a script input vector in so that Zap then understands the encoding, decodes, and then all the standard um, Zap functionality will work. We have standalone scripts, which are quite good for testing things. Session management scripts, so that you can under, so Zap can understand the um, session management. Targeted scripts that you can run from um, the sites and um, history tree. Web, WebSocket passive scan rules, uh, WebSocket senders, so a huge range of things. All of these things change Zap on the fly, uh, which I think makes Zap particularly powerful, particularly for um, professional pen testers. Two more questions to that? Yeah, so, so I'm going to actually just go to the... Um, I don't know. So it is, yeah, this is question time for, for the, any questions about the desk, Zap desktop. So one question is basically a follow-up question to the uh, XSS thing, to the payload, mm. and in general to the script section. Yeah. So uh, I'm also doing pen tests, and uh, what I like with other tools uh, that you uh, um, that you have a request and a response tab. Uh, how does it work with the scripting here? Is, is there something similar or? 
How? Right. I'm a bit so scripts run at particular times. So what happened? The request and response tabs are used when you select something. So we've got our so we just go to the history. We'll select something, and then you'll see the request and response scripts run. Um, so so let's just uh, if I have a look at the um, standalones. Yes, yeah, sorry. That's also important for fuzzing, I think. Yeah. So, I mean, basically, the, the scripts will run whenever whenever you want them to. So, um, what I can do is, I mean, any of these, have a look at, want to list the active scan rules, I can just run them. And what you'll see is we have a t um, tab down here, and all of the output appears. Um, so, you can get all, so output can appear here. But if you've got something like uh, an HTTP sender script, what that is going to do is that is going to change the requests and responses on the fly. So you don't actually see any of that unless you actually um, select one of those messages that been changed. If that makes sense. OK, uh, one other question that we had in the chat was how uh, sure. that can deal with CSRF protection. So basically, we have um, Zap has the understanding of CSRF. So um, if we go and have a look, so there's the, the gear icon here um, basically brings up options. A lot of the tabs have their own icon as well. Actually, here here's the anti -CSRF, CSRF tokens. So Zap has a built-in list of CSRF tokens. Um, if the ones you're using aren't aren't in there, you can add them. And then what happens is when, when Zap is doing an active scan, you've got an option to apply the anti-CSRF tokens. So, but as you can see, there's uh, we have a lot of options for a lot of things. But yeah, so Zap can handle handle those. Okay, and one earlier question was if uh, all the default settings in in Zap are basically what. Um, the, the the recommended best practice settings for mm -hmm. for for the, for the users yeah um, it, so we have we have a lot of settings for reasons so that we have good we only put new conf configuration items in for a reason um, but we think carefully about what the default should be so web testing as i'm sure a lot of you know is a complete pain there are so you know web applications do so many weird and wonderful things um, we would love to be able to make Zap a bit more intelligent about these things and apply things automatically, but that inevitably makes a, is a lot of work, and you've got a chance of getting it wrong. So what we tend to do is we tend to put the functionality in first, which is optional, so people can then choose to make change those settings. Um, and at some point in the future, we'd like to get to the stage where Zap can, where's a mode where Zap kind of tries to adjust things intelligently, uh, but that's fraught with dangers and a lot of work and. There aren't that many of us, really. <laughs> so there's no machine learning algorithm in Zap that, that actually mm, tries not, yeah, to but if you, I, well, No, but if someone getting, wants to implement then, then it, yeah, yeah, if someone wants to build, build that, then get in touch with me. We'd love to hear from you. OK, shall we move on then? Um, there were another couple of questions. One maybe is fitting. Good into here how it can be bypass WAF, for example, does up any tempering capability. Uh, so we don't have any explicit stuff. Um, we kind of go with the theory that if you you know you should only use tools like Zap when you actually have um, permission to attack these things, th these applications. If you are have permission, then I would strongly recommend removing WAFs. I think you you actually want to find out where the Applications are vulnerable without the WAF in place. Having WAFs confusing confuses things. Obviously, you can put scripts in there that do all sorts of weird and wonderful things um, to try and get around WAFs, but that's not something that I've focused on. Um, but uh, you know, there's I'm sure there's, there's stuff out there people can play with. Yeah, testing test, testing any application through a WAF, then you are basically just testing the WAF in most cases. Yes, probably exactly. not what you want. So yeah. you just whitelist. 
the IP exactly uh, yes. the attacker on the WAF, and that's that should be it. Yep, yeah, and we could, we've got options like putting you can inject a header into every um, request coming from Zap, which means and then you can put that in your WAF saying if you've got this particular header, this code, then ignore it as well. So you know you've got various options there. Are there any encode, encodings uh, which you can automatically apply or any um, obfuscation? In, uh... We could do with scripts with scripting. You can do whatever you like. So if you want to um, put put those in, then yeah, go for it. But nobody nobody did a, a script yet for, for example, to do some kind of uh, WAF evasion. Oh, uh, let's have a, so there might be something in the community scripts. Um, so that's have a look at the community scripts, and we can get back to that later. Okay. Um, there was one question. I'm not sure I understand, but I read it for you. Could okay. you explain? <laughs> Could you explain how to can reduce the noise in the sites tab? Is there a way to set the context on just calls to a specific host and not see the answer and so on? Uh, yeah. So if we um, just so we have these things called contexts, and these are kind of the um, so these are the things you're interested in typically. Um, so you can see that's got a, a target arrow um, thing on. If I click on the target, then we only see things that are in context. So yes, you can absolutely do that. OK, good. Uh, one other question, I think, before you leave uh, the the demo, um, the that was the question from uh, from me. Uh, when you invoke the browser, um, mm. it, um, probably I can find out by myself. But uh, as you are just here, how doing how you're doing that uh, to configure the browser so that it ignores uh, uh, any certificate mismatch and mm -hmm. uh, configures the proxy for you? So we use Selenium. So that's a Java project. Um, so all of the browser control um, we do via that. Um, and when you launch um, Selenium, you've got options to set whatever you want with modern um, browsers, i.e. Firefox and Chrome. So those two browsers are very good for configuring. Uh, if you remind me, I'll send you links to the code. Um, so we're open source. We can share these things. OK, cool. Thank you. Great. So that went took a lot longer than I expected. Um, so maybe we need another session. But uh, uh, I've probably got enough time to go through the HUD. Should I go for that? We have enough time, so we have enough time. Okay, but we, also, but we also so. happy for any other session in the future. <laughs> on that. So if if you are, if okay, you if you have have one hour uh, available only, that's that's fine. Then we just do a second session. <laughs> right. Well, I'm going to talk about the HUD now because it's fun. Uh, so I'm going to go back to the Quick Start tab, and one thing that I did, I disabled the HUD. Um, but normally it is enabled um, when you launch browsers. Um, so I'm going to enable it, and I'm going to launch the browser again. And what you'll see this time is we go to Budget, and all of a sudden, bang, uh, you get this big, very unsubtle splash screen. You, there's an option to get rid of the splash screen, but we wanted to make it really obvious what's happening. Um, and you've got two options here. You can continue to the target or take the HUD tutorial. Now, if you haven't tried it before, please take the HUD tutorial. Um, if you click on that, it opens a new window, and it will take you through the HUD. And it's a very simple little application, um, but it, we've got a lot of good feedback about it. People love it um, because it shows you all the things. Because when it comes to it, security tools aren't intuitive. Um, and there is, there's a reason for that, and it's because security stuff isn't intuitive. We're doing all weird stuff. Um, so, you know, we're doing things on the boundaries. We're doing unexpected things. So it's very difficult to make that intuitive. Um, even though we try to make the HUD as easy as possible, there are things you won't pick up and there are things I won't have time to go through. So please take the tutorial. It'll teach you a lot of things. So we're now running. Um, you might notice, actually, we're on HTTPS, even though uh, budget was on HTTP. We're actually upgrading um, budget. We're very kindly doing that and Zap because we're using every modern web technology under the sun, pretty much. Um, and for that, you need HTTPS. So we actually upgrade that um, because we're nice like that. Um, and then what you'll see is you'll see these kind of controls on the left hand side and the right hand side. And the ones on the left hand side are a bit more specific. Um, so they're related to the more to the page we're displaying now. 
uh, that is when you talk about traditional web applications more. Um, and then on the right hand side, it's more generic for the site as a whole. Um, and there's actually a little tab at the bottom as well. And one of the main things you'll see here is you'll see we've got these alerts. So if you actually click on one of these, then you'll see we've got a list of all of the alerts that, and this is very, this is just the same as you get within Zap. And you can actually go in and see the details as well. So you get all of the information. So this is exactly the same as if you're in Zap and looking at the alerts tab. So these are on the per page, and this is across the site as a whole. So here we can actually see the ones across the whole site. And again, you can go in and look at any of these. One of the other things is we will show uh, interesting bits of information. So if I actually go to actually keep an eye on the bottom right hand side, then you'll see down here there's a growler alert. Um, so basically, as we find new potential vulnerabilities, new alerts, then you will get those pop ups. You will only see them once for any particular type of alert. So if I go to the login page, I might well get another one. Can't remember whether there's one on here or not. Um, yep, there we go. So you can go and see that. But if you actually go back to the contact us one, we shouldn't see. Oh, interesting. That shouldn't have appeared. Okay, so there might be a bug there. So you should only see them once. Um, but there's also extra information. So the idea is we're trying to bring information from Zap into the browser. One thing here, you can see this little icon here, and it's got a two by it. So what that's telling us is there's a couple of hidden fields in there. And obviously, it's not obvious because they're hidden. But if you click on that icon, then we actually make the fields visible. We highlight them and we make them editable as well. And actually, if you've got fields that aren't ed editable, that control will actually make them editable as well. So I've actually got a non-default. I've got a, uh, this other option here um, tool installed down here. And that's comments. So you can see there's actually one comment. and that, you might not be able to see it, but there's a little red um, control there, which means an interesting comment. So if I click on there, the comments are actually now shown. And if you hover over, then you will see what the comment actually is. In this particular case, it is a link to an admin page. Um, so because it found the word admin in there, that triggered something which showed, OK, that's interesting. So the whole idea here is that we're actually showing interesting information. And we can also do things like, so actually, at the bottom, you can see the history again. You can see the history and web sockets, so the budget doesn't have any. And you can select any of these um, requests. So let's select one of them from budget. So we can actually see the request and the response. And we can change anything we like as well. That's not particularly interesting. So I'll just uh, submit something. And then I can go and post and I can submit something else as well. That's got an anti CSRF token. So I can replay that in the console or I can replay that in the browser. And we can also kick off the sorry, we've as well as displaying the history, we can display the sites tree as well. So this is a sites tree exactly the same as you'll see in the Zap desktop. So you can see navigate around and again you can see the requests and response and replay those. And we can kick off the traditional spider. We can kick off the Ajax spider. And we can kick off the active scanner as well. But one of the fun things we can do is we can actually kick off attack mode. So attack mode is a bit like, it's a bit like the active scanner, but it kind of follows you around. Um, so I will turn that on. But at the moment, it Oh, and there we go. We can find it. it's found some stuff already. And if we go and search, then so I forgot I'd added it to um, context, hadn't I? And there you see straight away we found cross-site scripting vulnerability. So all I'm doing is just clicking around and doing stuff. So if you're a developer or functional tester and you want to do some security testing, you can actually just use the Zap HUD play around with your application, do your normal kind of testing, and Zap will show you these interesting things and potentially find vulnerabilities. And what we see here is we go back to this search page, we'll actually see that um, Zap has flagged the very field, and you can actually go and see the particular um, vulnerability. We can actually look at that, and if we want, we can replay it in the browser. And there you go, that does look like a cross-site scripting vulnerability. Uh, so that is a very, 
quick introduction to the HUD. Uh, but before I go, uh, remember the thing about the intercepting. Um, so we want to go here and we want Can to just inject one one question about the HUD? Sure. Um, because that uh, that is a very obvious one that just came up in the chat. Um, is are there any plans to replace the the uh, desktop uh, front end or the desktop client entirely with a web based one? Because this is this looks really great. Right? <laughs> yeah. So this is maybe I think is the answer. So what we're trying to do with the HUD is we were trying to reimagine the Zap interface and the, the interface for security tools. We're not aware of anything like this in commercial tools or open source. Um, I mean, not even security tools. I haven't seen anything quite like this. Um, so the, we want to take the essential Zap features rather than throw everything in. But what the HUD is doing is Zap. It's HUD, the HUD is using the Zap API, and the Zap API covers pretty much all the desktop functionality. So yes, we could, in theory, replace the um, desktop with the HUD. Whether that's a good idea or not, I'm not sure yet. Um, what we want is feedback. We want people to play around with this. You know, I kind of like the idea that the HUD is quite lightweight and doesn't. It's not a really heavyweight tool. So right now, I don't think the HUD is suitable for, you know, in-depth pen testing. But if you've got initial application, I would be very tempted to, you know, if you're a professional pen tester, then why not use the HUD to just explore the application and because it allows you to focus on the application rather than your security tool. Sometimes you want to focus on the security tool, but a lot of the fun vulnerabilities are application ones, which security tools won't find. You need to w get under the skin of the application, realize how the, the logic behind it and break that. The security tool will help there, but I think focusing on application is really useful. So I can imagine you doing this and then using the Zap Desktop or maybe Burp Pro and for diving into particular things. And just to mention, um, you can actually run Zap in daemon mode with the HUD and you could proxy that through another tool. So you could actually have the Zap HUD with Zap in daemon mode proxying through um, Burp Pro. That or Burp, Burp uh, Community Edition, Edition, that works fine. Um, I've done a demo doing that. So you could then use the HUD, and if you're more used to using Burp, then you can play around with that um, when you want to dive in. But remember the thing about the um, with making changes on the fly and how it's switching between the browser and between the um, security tools app. All we can do here is we can just turn on break here. We can add to the basket, and the request actually appears in your browser. So we can actually put in well, minus a thousand and continue. And there we go. The, the shop now owes us money. But we've intercepted something in the bra and changed it in the browser. Um, and that just, I mean, for me, I think that's a bit of a game changer. It just makes things so much easier, so much quicker. So the HUD isn't something that will replace the Zap desktop or, or Burp or anything like that soon, um, but it's it's it it's definitely something new and gives you you know i think it's really useful okay i, th I think the question wasn't even meant like if the hut is supposed to replace the desktop mm. but if if uh, if another uh, another web based client it, for the full yeah. for the full mode basically would 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 be an it's, option because then it it would fit better together right with with yeah, the hut absolutely so yes if we could do one of the problems is we are a small team uh we are um you know we are completely overworked. We're doing this in our own time. Um, so we can't take on huge developments like that. Um, you know, we, it would be love, it'd be great to see how much we, how far we could get down that route, but developing interfaces is actually really expensive, um, in terms to actually get the interface right. And the HUD, there's not a, a huge amount of functionality here when it comes down to it, because we're actually, you know, the real functionality is being done by Zap, but just getting the the UI to the way we wanted us took took a long time. So yeah, uh, it would be great, but uh, we'd need more people contributing, I think. Yeah. So you're looking for people just as the juice. We shop. are always well. It's a, this. It's an open source problem, isn't it? You know, we don't have. I mean, Mozilla have been great with um, supporting me, but I can't spend all my time um, on Zap, and neither can any of the other volunteers. Um, so you know. We need um, people to help us, and that's so what, pretty... what's, your, what's your what's your time what's your schedule saying, Simon? Do you have maybe five minutes to show the GitHub actions, or is yeah, it something for next time then? 
Well, I mean, the it's kind of difficult to um, demonstrate the automation. So uh, I'll go through the automation quickly. Um, it's something that can go into a lot more detail, but actually the Zap in 10 stuff, we, we are covering that quite a bit. So maybe, you know, people can look at those videos. Um, so when it comes down to Zap automation, you've got quite a lot of options. You've got a command line scan, and I will mention this only briefly because it's very limited. Um, it exists, but I wouldn't recommend it for anything serious. We then have what we call package scans. And uh, actually, I didn't have many slides because what I was going to do is actually, um, it's really great because we've actually just put details of the um, package scans on the website. So zaproxy.org, we've got loads of stuff on here. Um, go to documentation and then Docker details. And what this will do, it'll give you lots of information about Docker. So we have a set of Docker images. We've got the stable image, which tracks the main release. So the current one is 290. We've got a weekly Docker image. We've got a live Docker image. And we've got a bare doc Docker image, which has the absolutely essentials, just a bare minimum. So we've got a CI environment. So you want to really tune down what you include. You can then include the bare image and just act actually add whatever you want. Then we have what we call these package scans. So we've got a baseline scan, an API scan, and a full scan. The baseline scan, um, again, so it's part of these Docker images. It's part of the, all of the Docker images. And you just need to specify a target. But there's lots of other in, um, options you can provide as well. What the baseline scan does is, by default, it did, does just a one minute spider. Um, and then does passive scanning. You can optionally include um, the Ajax spider. It includes what we call both of the um, release quality rules and the beta quality rules, but you include alpha quality rules as well. And this will only take you know just over a minute to run. So this is ideal to put in CI/CD. We use it at Mozilla in, like that, and we actually every day we test a couple of hundred Mozilla websites like that, um, and then we just stream all of the results into various things so we can create dashboards and stuff like that. So we've got the baseline scan. We have an API scan uh, which does actually active scanning, but in this case it targets things with an open API definition. We did support SOAP, um, SOAP definitions, but that's broken at the moment. So at the moment, it's just open API. But if you have an open API def definition, then you can use that to basically seed the Zap scan. And um, we've turned off a lot of the scan rules that don't apply to APIs and in added some new ones that are um, just relevant for APIs. Then we have the full scan. And again, you supply target, loads of options. Uh, and this does the full attacking. Obviously, it takes longer. Um, by default, there's no time limit on the spider. You can use the Ajax spider as well. But we've got these options for all of the scans have options for configuration files and configuration URLs. So you can tune Zap very, very closely. And I'm producing some documentation on how to do that. Uh, we've got some documentation, but it's always good to have more. We also have these things called scan hooks. And basically, these plug into all of the um, package scans, and they actually then run the hooks whenever something happens. So if you actually want to do particular things, um, or if you won't want to wait till your um, API tests have completed or whatever, you can control these package scans in a very, very powerful way. We also have this GitHub action. So this is new. And basically, if you go to the GitHub Marketplace and let's search for, we'll just search for OWASP. It should be the only thing there. And there you'll see the OWASP Zap baseline scan. And what this allows you to do is you can then add this to your repo. And it can be a private repo or a public one. And you can specify the target. You give a GitHub token, um, which obviously will be hidden. And then Docker, you can choose the Docker thing as well. You can configure the rules and command line options. And what will happen then is you can have this um, so it runs after pull requests or whatever, you know, any way that you can configure actions. You can do it scheduled. And it will then create issues if it actually finds anything. And it will also update those if issues and clear them if you either ignore them or you, you know, if you configure them to be ignored or if you fix them. And we've got examples of reports being created, and we're actually using this on zaproxy.org. 
Now we only have the baseline issue, but the baseline scanners action at the moment. We are working on a full scan action. However, what this means is that means we would be using GitHub infrastructure for performing attacks, and we potentially be attacking GitHub infrastructure like GitHub Pages, where that a proxy.org is actually hosted. So we're in active discussions with the GitHub security team so that they're happy with what we're doing and make sure that all the controls, safety controls are in place. Uh, but they're, they're being very good, um, very responsive about this, um, very supportive. So I'm really hoping that will be available before too long. And we also have this option with a daemon and API. So you can run Zap in daemon mode. Basically means it's headless, obviously. And then you've got the API, and the API is incredibly powerful. And we just go to back to the Zap ZAProxy.org. If you go to documentation, actually, I think it's off the front front page. Then we have automate with Zap. So this is the full API documentation. In general, Zap documentation leaves something to be desired, but we had a Google Season of Docs a student, uh, through Nirogen, who's produced some really great API documentation. So we've got very thorough API documentation, and we've had people actually congratulate us on it, and that hasn't happened with any other Zap documentation before. Um, so that is particularly, that is something that uh, we're particularly proud of. So if you want to find out more, we've got zaproxy.com and we've got this all day DevOps thing, Zap in 10. I'll just go back to um, the documentation. So go to the website and then there's a link off here, Zap in 10. And we've got a whole series of videos. There's um, the main one is displayed there, but we have loads more which are available. So the idea is these are 10 minute videos um, about particular things. And the idea is so I actually did a tutorial on Friday that I've already mentioned, and that's going to be chopped up, probably not into 10 minute sections, but it will be put on there. So those are videos which will tell you all about Zap. Um, so those are a great place to start. And if you go to zaproxy.com, then there's loads more information. So we've got things like you know if you support so we've got links to the user group to issues we're on irc so you can get a hold of that way the bug bounty program if you think you found a vulnerability in zap uh, that is exploitable and lots of ways to get involved as well so uh, loads of fun stuff there okay so that was kind of what i was um planning on doing so i'm going to stop presenting now and open up to questions Okay, there were a few questions. One interesting one hmm. is uh, what are the options to make Zap a fail or even crash from a perspective of a defender on the target machine? Uh, hopefully none. Um, <laughs> so um, we try to make sure that Zap is robust as possible and <clears throat> um, is safe for people to use. If you find a vulnerability um, that gives a remote code execution on the pen testers, on the person using Zap's uh, machine, we actually have a bug bounty on this. So we will pay out $1,000 if you can compromise the Zap user. Uh, and we have paid out a couple of times. Um, so, and those are public. Um, so we try and make sure, and, you know, Pen tester is obviously trying this out. Um, so my recommendation is, if you are a developer and you're, you know, you should be worried about people attacking your website, but trying to attack the tools is not the way to go. There are simple ways to, you know, we know of firewalls that block Zap requests by default, but they usually do simple things like checking the user agent. There's nearly always ways around these. If you rely on those sort of things. You're, you're going to be in for a world of pain. You need to make sure that your applications are actually secure um, without relying on those tricks. So spend your time making your application secure, not trying to mess with security tools. That's my recommendation. But uh, your mileage may vary. That was a very good answer. Um, I was wondering whether um, there's a user agent, for example, you just mentioned a user agent. I would I would uh, think at least for passive scanning, there's no, no user agent because you just use a user agent from the browser. 
But for passive, exactly. passive scanning, there is one. No, no, no. So passive scanning, we don't change anything. All we're doing is looking and looking at stuff. Um, so we actually had a few issues reported to us through the bug bounty where people could detect that you were using the Zap. If you if you're using the HUD. It, the website will be able to detect that you're using the HUD. Uh, we do too many nasty things. Uh, we actually change the target application. So, yeah. Um, but anything that someone can do on a website, um, you can undo on Zap. Zap is the last tool in the chain. So if someone's doing something to mess with the HUD or any of the other part of Zap, then it's easy to put a script in to undo them. So it then just becomes a bit of a you know a um, whack a mole type game. So you know. Make your application secure. That's focus on that rather than try to break security tools. That's my advice. Okay. Um, I think uh, there's one that. question about JA3 signatures. If yep. those are uh, d d d considered or can be changed for evasion, or is that going to the similar similar way of trying to cheat the security tools? JA3. Don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I also. I have no idea what that yep. means. Maybe, nope. maybe Zab Sebastian, if if you can unmute and explain that, if you want. Or not? Okay. Hmm. So yep. we we don't know JA three signatures. Nope. There was one question regarding the DOM. Hmm. I cannot find any more. Yeah, it was about about uh, because Zap is not able to click through uh, the application. That was some question about the shadow DOM. Shadow DOM, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so I mean, anything to do with navigating the um, target application, you need to do in the browser, or we can do with the Ajax Spider. Um, then, so Zap doesn't hook into the shadow DOM or something like that. With the HUD, we are we now have a Zap presence in the browser, so we have we can access the target application. We can access the target DOM, and we've got our own Zap domain as well. And there's a careful separation. There's a lot more we could do with um, client side. We know that we've got a lot of plans, but again, not enough people, um, so not enough time. So there's loads of fun things. So if you want to get involved, if you want to play around with these fun things, then get in touch with me. So, so at the moment, um, almost everything in the HUD is manual stuff, right? So there's not, not nothing automated from the HUD that is. Uh, the, the HUD is very much is very much a manual tool, but the technology we've got means we have a we have a way to get Zap presence in the browser, uh, which is an important start. And we've got a lot of plans, but yeah, not enough people so at time. With, with more people, it could be extended a lot yeah. absolutely we we've always got a million things to do uh you know so commercial companies have dozens of you know tens of people working full-time on the tools we've got you know four people working part-time uh plus a lot of occasional contributors so uh, there's a limit to what we can do but uh you know please if you want to play around with it and have some fun with zap and uh help us make it better then get in touch with me are there any more questions Nothing in the chat. Nope, doesn't seem so. so. Nobody speaks up. Great, probably a good time to leave then. Okay. <laughs> Great, then thank you very much, Simon. Yes, I hope thanks you a lot. It useful. That's a pleasure. Of, of a course. Really great introduction. Yeah. And I will stop the recording now. Okay. Thanks a lot, folks. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you, you, Simon.